Some call them the oldest mountains in the world, a biological treasure. The Southern Blue Ridge Mountains. Some call it the Blue Ridge Escarpment. We call them home. The Highlands Plateau, encompassing the villages of Highlands and Cashers, contains some of the most diverse flora and fauna anywhere in the world. Lying along the Eastern Continental Divide, the area's average annual rainfall of more than 85 inches flows to the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. That nurturing moisture, rapid elevation changes, and temperate climate have made our home the most biologically diverse region in the world. More than 750 wildflower species flourish in our mountains. There are 130 tree species, 190 aquatic species, and almost 700 native vertebrate species that call this region home. Four hundred plants in the Blue Ridge are rare, and more than 250 of them grow nowhere else on Earth. Unfortunately, the very reason our home is so beautifully unique is perhaps the greatest threat to the continued richness of our plant and animal life. As more people want to come here, the land gets chopped into more residential developments, golf courses, and home sites. The vast stretches of wildness is getting tamed for one species, humans, at the expense of everything else. A big part of the problem with fragmentation is that you end up uh, cutting off the natural uh, ecological and evolutionary processes which are really critical to certain species. Uh, and so you divide up the habitat so, uh, so that patches are no longer connected and that affects, has genetic effects on things like gene flow and the uh, genetically affected population size, but it also can have effects ecologically where a small population simply may dwindle to extinction. This rich environment has been well known for centuries. Early naturalists such as William Bartram and Andre Michaud were deeply moved by what they witnessed as they explored this new world. In the late 1800s, these mountains were drawing summer visitors who were escaping the South's brutal heat, humidity, and sometimes disease. Even then, the changing landscape startled the visitors and settlers. In 1909, developers wanted to build a hotel on the top of Satula Mountain, which has a commanding 360-degree view of the surrounding mountains. We are actually standing on the property that started the whole thing because there was a group of citizens who realized that Satula Mountain was going to be developed in 1908 and in a matter of just a few weeks time raised $550 to buy this whole top of Satula Mountain. And from there, we have added to it as money's become available and as property has uh, become available. It was the beginning of conservation in the South and of the South's oldest conservation organization. The Ravenel family, who owned land from Highlands to Cashers, donated a 10-acre park in 1914 for the public's enjoyment. When I come to this spot, um, I am just flooded with memories of a wonderful childhood playing on this unspoiled piece of property. I only can appreciate it now in maturity of how really important uh, this gift was to the town of Highlands. Uh, and I, I wish that more people had that feeling for the land, that they would be so generous to do this, this kind of gift of a very valuable piece of property that, uh, to remain unspoiled forever. These early land conservation efforts were protected through the decades by families of the early residents and citizens. During these years, 
the unique nature of our area was confirmed by the creation of the Highlands Biological Station. Scientists from across the nation came here to study this biologically rich region. Back into the 1800s, all of the very famous uh, uh, naturalists and biologists came to Highlands to, to not only to study at the biological station, but long before that. And we can go way back in time. The very first one that we know that came here was a, a Frenchman by the name of Andre Michaud. And he came up right across Highlands. His, his journal shows, his, he kept a really good journal, a daily journal, shows very clearly that he came right across Highlands. And he describes all of the plants and natural uh, beauty of the Highlands Plateau. And he, of course, he was a botanist and he appreciated the plants. Despite the interest by the scientists, vast stretches of the remaining old growth forests that went from Highlands to Whiteside Mountain were harvested in the mid-1900s. The, the primeval forest itself extended all the way from, uh, from town, from, from uh, Bear Pin Mountain all the way out to the other side of Whiteside Mountain. It was about 3,000 acres of land that was never disturbed and never harvested, never cut and never burned. They were beautiful, beautiful, huge old trees, just a magnificent forest. And we called it the primeval forest. Uh, and the trees there were so big, these were hemlock trees and yellow poplar trees and, and even maple, red maple, huge red maple and black cherry and those kind of species, uh, yellow birch. We call, we call the biggest trees like the huge uh, hemlocks, we call those sequoia trees because uh, we, could, uh, we could relate to giant sequoias. By the late 1980s, the Land Trust incorporated and became more active in conservation education and land protection. More property owners sought partnership with the Land Trust to help preserve the places they loved. The Land Trust mission has become a rallying cry to everyone who wants to say what is beautiful and draws us here in the first place. We want to preserve the natural areas, scenic beauty, and green spaces of the Highlands Plateau for the enjoyment and benefit of the public. The Sargent family donated the area's first conservation easement to the Highlands Cashers Land Trust in 1996. This was soon followed by the 89-acre Simmons easement on a family farm in Clear Creek. Donations of significant tracts of natural forest land were made by Ermie Dixon, Hillary and Beverly Quinn, and Ray McPhail, Will Stoltz, and Alan McRae. Dr. and Mrs. Tom German protected the top of Laurel Knob, the highest cliff face east of the Mississippi River. And with a dramatic response, local residents gave very generously in 1998 to help preserve another eight acres on the top of Satula Mountain. By the beginning of this new century, the Land Trust had joined with the Highlands Biological Station to present a summer-long series of public talks about the natural history and heritage of our beloved mountains. Hundreds of curious people have been educated and entertained by the Zahner Conservation Lecture Series. Working with the land stewards of the Highlands Plateau, the Land Trust helps spread the wisdom about preserving and protecting our native plants while homeowners enjoy their property here. The Land Trust also completed a strategic plan to guide it thoughtfully into the new century. This called for expanding its mission to include the Cashers vicinity of Jackson County. With a service area of 278 square miles, the Highlands Cashers Land Trust now has a formidable challenge to protect what we love about our mountains. Macon and Jackson counties have no zoning laws to restrain unwanted or destructive development. In North Carolina, more than 155,000 acres of farmland, forest, and open space are lost each year to development. That's an average of 427 acres of open space a day, or 17 acres an hour, lost forever. That is a land area the size of Charlotte, North Carolina, gone each year, that will never be restored. We must rely upon the goodwill of you, our residents and visitors, to help preserve our majestic landscape. We're 
sort of fortunate in that uh, nearly half of the land in Macon County is owned by the National Forest Service. And of course, the, the other thing uh, is that the Highlands Land Trust, which is the oldest land trust in the state of North Carolina, uh, got started relatively early. And so they've been preserving natural areas and green space for some time. Uh, with the pace of that having stepped up pretty dramatically uh, in recent years. It's critically important for people to be aware of the fact that everything we do has an impact on all of the plant and animal life of the area. And people, in a, in a sense, end up loving the area to death because everybody wants to be here because it's so beautiful. The scenery, the birds, the uh, you have bears uh, coming around to your uh, bird feeders. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, just you see interactions between plants, animals, and fungi that you simply don't see other places anymore. And this is what brings people up here, but then the more people who come up, then the more the environment is at risk of being degraded. The Land Trust has made a major effort to work with those who control the land the realtors, landowners, and developers to make our certain growth less harmful to our environment. You know, our lifeblood is the beauty of the area. That's all we've got to sell is the climate and the beauty. Uh, and I think we are bound to try our best to protect that. By working with everyone, the Land Trust hopes to demonstrate that good stewardship of the land is in everyone's best interest. Here we have a serious problem today because we have large, we have increasing population, we have large urban areas that through the whole process of, uh, I forget the words, but sir, move people moving to the suburbs and separate little cities popping up, it's all moving up here and over here. And so you have more and more people. And then that brings more and more development of all kinds, of all types. Now a lot of people don't mind that as long as it doesn't encroach on their house and their yard. But the fact is we have to conserve that which, that which people come up here for in the first place. And the primary attraction is mountains. And mountains don't look like deserts, but they will if we cut down all the trees. <laughs> and so you got to conserve a, a reasonable amount of this and do the best that you can. The examples of indifference to how a community grows are too widespread. We can all point to some formerly lovely resort town that became too popular too fast. You see what's happened to other areas where they've, the conservation has not been a big part of the game plan and uh, obviously it's not a pretty sight in some areas. Um, I wish Macon County was more involved. Um, you can really see what's happened between the foot of the mountain and the Franklin in the last 10 years where it used to be sort of a pastoral little setting with small houses and gardens and now it's getting trashed up with um, just basically all kinds of bad development with no control. I think the real estate community's come to realize that uh, bad development benefits nobody in the long run. We encourage conservation by accepting donations of special land an owner wants to preserve in its natural condition. Urban green spaces are an essential part of our community's well-being and are a key part of our mission. These small oases of natural areas give peaceful relief from the often hectic commercial growth. We all need time to, to relax and to um, learn to not be stressed so much, to take a moment to enjoy what nature has to offer, the trees, the birds, our native flowers around here are just, um, we're, we're real lucky to be in this area. Also, an increasingly popular protection tool is the conservation easement. Through the easement, a landowner can donate certain development rights to the land trust which stay in effect forever. At the same time, the owner can still enjoy his or her property, sell it, or leave it to children. One of the largest such conservation efforts was donated in 2005 by Will McKee owner of High Hampton Inn and Cashers. The easement permanently protects more than 290 acres on Chimney Top and Rock Mountains. Both of these mountains being visible from so many different places, it just seemed 
imperative to me that they get in a situation where they these viewscapes would be protected. Um, it, particularly Chimney Top, which is uh, actually 400 feet higher than Rock Mountain, um, although it's hard to tell that from here, is actually uh, quite visible in a 360 degree view, really as far away as is Stocks away. And it, it seems to me, living up here, that the reason that people come here is to enjoy these incredible landscapes, these incredible mountains, and that uh, if, if we can prevent as many of the mountains from being dotted with houses as possible, then uh, we will uh, preserve the goose that laid the golden egg and uh, preserve something that really is sort of a Yosemite of the South, if you will, and uh, something for, that really should be preserved for all time. Because of the actions of one person who had the motivation and foresight, a significant part of the mountain landscape we all enjoy and sometimes take for granted will remain as we see it now. Everyone will benefit for generations to come. One person made it happen, just as dozens of property owners and highlands and cashers have done through the decades to protect more than 1,000 acres of our special corner of the Blue Ridge Escarpment. I do believe that uh, in development and conservation should be linked. Uh, if they're not, number one, the resource is exhaustible and will be exhausted very quickly. Um, so it's in the developer's self-interest to, um, to preserve the, uh, the beauty of the area. Support for the Highlands Cashers Land Trust has grown enormously in the past few years. Since 2001, when we launched our membership program, hundreds of residents and visitors alike have recognized the essential role we play in protecting the natural heritage of our community. With a resounding voice, they are saying yes to sound conservation. I didn't really want to be remembered by my grandchildren's grandchildren as just somebody who practiced dentistry in Atlanta for 40 years. What I have envisioned is that maybe one of these days, one of these great-great-grandchildren may be hiking this same trail we hiked to come up here and see one of these little land trust signs that says preserved and protected by the land trust and that one of my grandchildren will say, you know, I think my great-great-granddaddy had something to do with helping to preserve some of these natural properties up here, and that would make me happier than anything else I could have contributed. And so the tradition of preserving what is both beautiful and unique within our communities continues a century later. We are fortunate to have had a group of such forward-looking citizens in our history, for they have taught us a valuable lesson that contrary to popular opinion of the day, when we act to preserve our natural heritage, we are looking to our future and not just our past.